appreciate your willingness to do that. And again, I am Beck Ashby. I am a city council person for the city of Port Orchard. And currently this year, I am chair of the Peninsula RPTO. And I was chair last year also. This is my second year. And typically just some housekeeping for our new folks is because particularly okay. because we are recording this, I will want the public to know who you all are. So I will introduce you by how you're presented on my screen. So if you'll just acknowledge yourself when I say your name, the public will know who you are. And when we have action items, uh, quite frequently our action items are non-controversial. Um, they've been discussed at a couple of meetings ahead of time. And so we will use unanimous consent um, for many of our action items. I will, after a motion is made and seconded and the discussion is complete, I will ask if there's anyone who would like to uh, vote in the negative on the motion. And if we hear none, I offer that opportunity a couple of times. And if we hear none, then we pass the motion with unanimous consent. Please do not feel compelled that you have to vote for every motion. Um, we will definitely then take a roll call vote because under the Open P Public Meetings Act, uh, the public has a right to see who is voting how. Um, so we do that just to expedite our meetings along. So with that, I will introduce people as I see them on my screen, and I may um, mispronounce your name. If so, let me know, and I will try and do it better right next time. And when we get done, we do have some new people to our executive board. And after I get done with all the uh, introductions, um, we will allow you all just to say a few words if you would like to. From my screen, the first person I see is Ed Coviello, who works for um, Kitsap Transit, but he is one of our administrative coordinators for the RPTO. For our new folks, Kitsap Transit is our lead planning agency. And next I see myself, and then I see Thera Black, who is our administrative coordinator. I see Ted Jackson, who is new to our board. He is replacing Judy Scott. He is with the Port of Allen. And so Ted, we will come back to you later to see if you have a few words. Next, I see Wendy Clark Getson, who is with Jefferson County and chair of our technical committee. I next see an old friend who hasn't been here with us for quite a while, and that's John Winans. And he is the Olympic Regions um, DOT, I don't know, manager. The head guy at Olympic Region. That's how I know John. Okay. And then we have Ed Stern, who is on the um, city council for the city of Paulsbo, and he is the immediate past chair of the Association of Washington Cities. We have Steve Gray, who is with the Public Works Department uh, for Clallam County. And then we have John Clausen, who is the executive director of Kitsap Transit. He is also, um, for those of you who are unaware, uh, a council mate of mine at the city of Port Orchard, but nine to five, he is exclusively Kitsap Transit. So when you hear him spoke, speak in these gatherings, it's on behalf of Kitsap Transit and I speak on behalf of the city of Port Orchard. And we have Kate Dean, who is new to us. Uh, she is a Jefferson County Commissioner. And Kate is replacing our longtime friend who will much be missed, David Sullivan. So when you think of Kate, that's a jurisdiction. She's with David's old jurisdiction. Then we have Andrew Nelson, who is with Kitsap County's Public Works Department. He is an alternate um, for Rob Gelder, the County Commissioner. And frequently we're used to seeing David Fort, but David had other commitments today. So Andrew and David and Rob are all kind of interchangeable for us. And now is my biggest challenge of the day for my screen. It's, <laughs> and he's smiling, he knows. It's Lindy, Lindsay Shoreham Warren. 
his last name. Uh, he is a council person from the city of Port Angeles. We have Ariel Spiezer, who is with the city council of Port Townsend. We have Michael Bateman, who is um, with the public works department of the city of Palspo. We have Chris Hartman, who is with the Port of Port Angeles. We have Sarah Crouch, who is with Jefferson Transit. And Jefferson Transit is our physical agent and Sarah is in charge of our money. We have um, Gias Sanoi um, with, he's the new planner for the um, Department of Transportation for Olympic Region. And we'll give you an opportunity to speak in a minute. And then we have Annette Nessie, who is with the Jamestown Squallum Tribe and probably one of our most long-term members. We have Gary Anderson with the Port of Bremerton. And we have Mike, is it Clouts? Or Matt, excuse me. And he is with the city of Squim. He is, he's been with us at a few other meetings, but he replaced David Garlington. We have Brandon Meyer. And are you representing um, Column Transit today? Yep, Col okay. Column Transit. Okay, thank you. And then we have Tammy Rupert, who is the executive director of Jefferson Transit. And we have Chris Grewell. Uh, from the Lower Elwha, and Danette Brennan from Mason Transit, and I thought you were taking another position. Is that in the future? I see. Yes, so today is my last day at Mason Transit, and I will be moving to Paris Transit, um, and Mike Ringenberg will be um, sitting in my place. He's my alternate anyway, so um, yes. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have Cliff Hall with the Department of Transportation. Um, so that's everybody on my screen. If I missed anyone, please let me know. And I will go then around my screen to the new folks. Ted Jackson, did you wanna say a few words or introduce yourself? Or, and you don't have to, but you're sure welcome to if you'd like. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm Ted Jackson. I'm with the Port of Allen and I'm uh, not replacing just we're doing a little bit of change for Judy Scott. Judy Scott had mentioned uh, numerous times how important uh, this committee is to our community. So I, I feel very fortunate to come on the heels of Judy. Uh, I spent uh, over 30 years uh, retired as his uh, interim chief of the city of DuPont. I spent most of my career as a fish and wildlife officer uh, covering Kitsap Mason Jefferson Clown County as a supervisor. So uh, I'm, I'm excited to be here, excited to learn. Uh, as I told Thera the other day that uh, I'll pretty much be quiet this meeting. I just wanna, I just wanna listen and learn. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Ted. Glad to have you. And it sounds like you're very familiar with the region. Kate, did you want to say a couple things? Sure. Um, nice to meet those of you I haven't met before. I know many of you that I'm serving my second term as a uh, commissioner and was involved in multi-county economic development planning prior to getting elected. Um, I'm a huge fan of multimodal transportation. To give you an idea, I've a, a family of six spread between Seattle, Bainbridge, and Port Townsend. We have one four-seater car. Um, and we get by just fine with bikes and buses and walking. And so pretty familiar with transportation limitations. I've been on the peninsula for 20 some years um, and uh, coveted the opening of this position for Jefferson County. I was really excited to um, take over when David retired. So glad to be here. Yes, thank you. And we're happy to have you. Um, I add, uh, Beck, Kate is also the past chair of the Municipal Research and Services Center Board, really important position. Oh, okay, thank you, Ed. And Dick Taylor from the Port of Shelton just joined us. Yeah, Wait, good morning. There, there, okay. And we will go on. Uh, John, did you want to introduce your new planner? I think I'll, um, I'll let Gaius do that. Um, I, I'll just point out that Joseph Perez, um, I think Joseph attended some of these meetings. Um, Dennis Engel is still our planning manager. Um, and uh, Dennis now reports to Gaius. So, Gaius, why don't you say a few words? Okay. 
Um, good to be with you all this morning. So uh, my name is Gayu Sonoy. So I've been with WashDOT uh, for about 24 years. So I have background in, um, in planning, traffic, design and construction. So I, I'm a licensed professional engineer and um, also have a master's degree in uh, business administration. And it's really good to be with you all. Um, so uh, I've been in a, a project office for the past four years in Fife, um, uh, delivering projects, uh, mostly in Pierce County, the I-5 projects and, um, and also the 167 project. So um, good to be with you all. And um, so this is, uh, it, this, this is kind of a new world opening up to me. Um, you know, uh, I've been mostly focused on you know, specific projects uh, for a long time. So, but uh, I'm, I'm really excited about this new position and, um, and the ability to work with the regional planning organizations. So thank you for inviting me. Yes, and thank you. We appreciate you being here. And Chris, did you want to say a few words? Hello, my name's Chris. <clears throat> um, I was in the Air Force for 10 years as an air traffic controller and uh, got out and uh, took over my own federal facility as the manager there. And uh, that's where I learned, uh, kind of became the master of the quality assurance and organizational change. And so once I finished my master's, I got hired out here at ELWA uh, to help them with the quality assurance that they have out here and uh, help them build a public works department uh, formally. So I'm uh, really excited to be here and work with everyone here and. Uh, help the communities the best that we can. We're really glad to have your tribe involved. That's, that gives us pleasure. So with that, the other thing I will say to our new people, um, if during our discussions you wanna speak, you can put something in the chat room. Um, Ed Coviello does a nice job of monitoring that for us. Or um, as long as the screen is up, if you wave or just start talking, I will acknowledge you. And for the, again, for the new folks here, I am not particularly bashful about calling on you. So um, you got to pay attention. If you're snoozing, I may call on you anyway. Um, that's what I have to say this morning. And so we will begin our agenda with the approval of our minutes from the December 18th meeting and the consent calendar, which is the approval of the second quarter invoice. Those are both our two consent items. Is there a motion to approve? I moved. Thank you, Dick. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. Thank you. So uh, are there any discussions on either of the items? Hearing none is we have a motion and a second to approve the meeting summary from December 18th and our quarter, our second quarterly invoice. Is there anyone who would be wishing to vote against those issues? Is there anyone who would be wanting to vote against those issues? Hearing none, they, the motions pass with unanimous consent. So we will move on to our consolidated grant applications. And I believe that is Zara or Ed. We'll probably tag team this a okay. little bit. We are, I'm coming to you today asking for your action on two different things. First, uh, we will, and we'll brief you on it, but first is your action on approving a ranking of projects that um, went through the consolidated grants review process. And so we will be asking for a recommendation to the state as to the ranking that's presented to you. And then also we're asking for um, your approval to amend these projects by reference into the human services transportation plan. The consolidated grants process is um, a, a statewide uh, public transit funding process that um, is administered by uh, WashDOT headquarters out of the Public Transportation Office. Through this process, they um, award a variety of funds from state and federal sources to projects across the state 
that benefit um, what we think of as coordinated uh, human services transportation. So uh, really targeting uh, uh, services and, and facilities to support the needs of the most vulnerable people in our region. Um, so we work in this arena, we work with some uh, we work with our transit providers. They're, you know, maybe the most familiar of the service providers in this category, but we also work with social service providers in this program. And so um, I hope that in preparation for today's meeting, um, you all got to see, you know, look at the videos that were presented because it gives you a real sense of the personal impacts that these programs have on the day-to-day -day lives of real people across our region. Um, the way the process worked is that WashDOT issued a call for projects and that concluded on October 31st. Um, they then sent to PRTPO um, all of the projects that were submitted from within this region. And it is the responsibility of PRTPO to then inform WashDOT what the priority ranking is of those projects. PRTPO, I wanna be really clear, has no money to award to these projects. Instead, what this ranking confers on the projects are some points that then get added to their score in a statewide competitive process. So those projects that receive an A ranking, and we had two of those slots available this year to award, um, will receive 50 points on their statewide competitive score. Projects that receive a B ranking will receive 25 extra points on their statewide score. And those projects that receive uh, a C ranking, which is still really good, gets, gets um, an additional 12 projects on their score. We have um, a set number of slots that we're allowed to uh, put these projects into. So that's why we have two A's, uh, I forget what it is now off the top of my head, four, four or five B's and the rest were C's because that was the available slots that we had. So, um, and I think in the staff report, it gives a little bit more background and I can answer any questions those who want to know more detail about it. We uh, convened a special ranking subcommittee to review the projects. They completed their evaluation and review in early January. We sent that recommendation to the TAC for its consideration in Jan in, on January 21st. The TAC considered that recommendation and endorsed it, concurred with it, and, and forwarded that own recommendation onto the board. The TAC also recommended that the board amend these projects into the Human Services Transportation Plan. Um, we issued a uh, public notice that we were intending to amend that plan and amend these projects into it, and we received no comments. And so today I bring to you uh, that recommendation that came forward originally from this ranking committee, then the TAC, and then to the board. The projects are presented in there um, as, as, um, as they came up through that. And I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. And then, um, like I said, at the end, we'd be looking for action on two items. First, to approve the ranking as presented or however you would choose to have it go. And then um, secondly, to amend these projects into the Human Services Transportation Plan. And Ed, did I miss anything that um, we should add? Um, the only thing, it's, it's more of a um, uh, just informational that we had a um, we have a new human services provider that will be providing service in Mason County um, Coastal Cap, um, and they applied both for operating and a capital project to replace the van. That'll be a new service in our region that has been there before. In partnership with Sarah, are you looking for two separate motions or one motion? Uh, it's, if you're going to work off of, off of the staff report, it's probably easiest to take it as two. I, I, however you want to, however you want to. I'm it. sorry, I didn't pull through this. Do we have resolutions? We do, um, we do not have a, a, um, a resolution on this one. It's just two actions. Okay. Okay. Um, do we have a motion to approve the ranking assessment for the consolidated grant applications? Having served on the selection committee, TAC, and now this committee, I, I move that we approve the, the ranking. Thank you, Dick. Is there a second? I'll second that. Thank you. Who was that? I'm Brendan. Uh, Brendan Meyer. Excellent. Thank you, Brendan. I missed you. Is there any discussion on the consolidated grant ranking process or the outcome of that ranking process? 
I would just say, I would make a couple of comments. And one is I did not participate in the ranking process, but I did um, attend the, um, the meeting via Zoom and it was very thorough. Um, the evaluators put a great deal of time and effort in, in, in their evaluation and their scoring. So we much appreciate their effort. Um, the other thing I will say is normally we have seven A's, seven B's and seven C's. But two years ago during this process, it was opened up to four year awards. And many of our awards last time were for four years. That's why we had limited A's and B's and C's this time. That is just offered as an ex, uh, explanation. And I will also, for our new folks, introduce Randy Netherland from Mason County, who has joined our meeting. Is there um, any discussion? Um, John, please. Yeah, Madam Chair, I just, uh, because Kitsap Transit has a project on this list, I'm gonna be abstaining from any voting on this. Thank you. Is there any other comment? Okay, um, we have a motion that has been seconded to approve the consolidated um, grant rank listing as presented um, by the evaluation committee and approved by our technical support committee. Is there anyone who would prefer to vote against this motion? I would ask again, is there anyone who would prefer not to approve this, this, um, this grant, grant ranking? Seeing none, the motion approves with unanimous consent with one abstention. Uh, Chair Ashby? Yes. Just to let you know, um, Ariel Spetzer um, had to log out, so she's back in now. So we oh, may okay. want to ask her for her vote. Ariel, we voted while you were out on the consolidated grant ranking. Yes. I, thank you so much, Beck. I, I heard it. I just wasn't, um, the sound cut out right when people were voting. I vote yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Okay. And the other motion we're looking for is to amend our 2019 Human Services Transportation Plan to include by reference these particular um, consolidated grant projects. Is there anyone who would like to make a motion to add these um, grant, uh, consolidated grant projects to the 2019 Human Services Plan. I move to add them to the 2019 Services Transportation Plan. Thank you, Tammy. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ed. Is there any discussion? Okay, hearing none. We have a motion and a second on the floor to amend the 2019 Human Service Transportation Plan to include by reference the uh, 2021 consolidated grant projects. Is there anyone who would prefer to vote against that motion? I will ask a second time, is there anyone who would prefer to vote against that motion? Hearing none, the motion uh, is approved with unanimous consent. Thank you. And now moving on down our agenda, we will um, talk about that GIS system that we've been talking about for the last two or three meetings and working with AWC. And I believe again, that's probably Thera and Ed. Yeah, this is us coming back. Um, we, um, by background, we, uh, had funding in our state fiscal year that rolled over from fiscal year 2020. And we came to the board in uh, uh, late 2020 to talk about how we might program that um, in a useful way. It needs to be spent by the end of the year. And one of the services that we identified as a sort of a, I'm gonna say new RTPO standing up and building its own uh, resources now that it's independent from WashDOT is uh, we, we decided that it would be helpful if we could get some GIS support services. We have, uh, I'm gonna say we, it's really Ed has um, some GIS skills that are 
good skills to support our members if we had a little bit of help on the front end, building the tools and the templates for our region, our four county region with the diversity of partners that we have. So that is what we um, came to you in December and asked uh, for permission or approval to uh, pro begin our procurement process to, to obtain those services. We have about $14,300, so it's not a lot of money to, to spend on this. We, um, we had been working and, 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 and ended up really settling on the AWC Association of Washington Cities has a GIS consortium in-house that um, has been in place for about five or six years now where they provide these types of GIS services to public agencies, municipalities, um, um, quasi-municipal groups like ours, and uh, just filling in a, a need in the community. We, we certainly, so we, know, we knew a lot about that, but we didn't know what other programs were available. So we looked around, we went to Esri, which is the company, according to our procurement policy, we needed to get three bids. So we went to Esri, which is the company that actually makes the software platform that we're, we'll be working on. And they do provide services, but they are really geared to more cutting edge, um, new technology kinds of things. And they felt that, you know, they'd be happy to provide services to us, but they felt that it would not be a really good value proposition for PRTPO. Um, but, and, and they are also very familiar with the AWC GIS consortium. And they said many of their clients who use their products actually get more out of their products because of the help that they got from the consortium. We also um, reached out to Parametrics, which is a private firm that does a lot of work for a lot of our communities. And we all have some experience with them and doing some website work. So we reached out to them and they were, they were really interested in trying to work with us and help us uh, put something together. Uh, their experience is primarily in the arena of really big projects and, pro and, and developing websites for a project, like a big road project or a big uh, a regional transportation plan. And we're looking for something more general purpose, um, uh, you know, more of a, um, you know, and all around, you know, tools that can help us do a whole lot of things. And we just felt like based on the experience or dozens of, of institutions that AWC has, has done business with and is still doing business with, um, it just seemed like the best setup for us. So that's, we come to you today with a recommendation that um, we um, pursue a contract with the AWC GIS consortium uh, in accordance with our procurement policy, we need um, authorization from the board to pursue uh, the contract with them, to execute a contract with them. And so we have in your agenda packet um, sort of that background material that we needed to provide you as a, in accordance with our policy, as well as the draft contract language for you to look at. AWC has its own, because it's a service, they're a service, this is a service they provide to their members. They already have a standard boilerplate um, service agreement, just like, you know, for anybody. And then because we are doing this with um, RTPO funds from the state, we have an addendum attached to that that spells out. Um, cut out. Did anybody, am I, I'm, maybe I'm cutting out here. Oh, you're back on now. Are you, do you? You're good, Brendan. But the. Uh, All right, uh, thank you. Yeah. So we um so that that's what's before you today is just the results of our procurement process. This is the very first time we've gone through our procurement process um, like this. So um, we were learning some things along the way, and we might tweak the policy just a little bit to make it better align with the real world. <laughs> but we'll come back with you um, for that in the future. But right now, what we're looking for from you is any questions you might have, and then ultimately your um, approval, uh, authorization to um, execute this contract with the um, AWC and get this work underway. Yeah, Sarah, Sarah, I had a quick question. Oh, sorry, Beck. No, I was going, I was just gonna say what we're looking for now is a motion to approve resolution 01-2021 
authorizing the one year AWC GIS consortium service agreement. That's the motion we're looking for right now. Madam Chair, uh -huh. I'm gonna recuse myself from this vote in the interests of public disclosure. I'm past president of the Association of Washington City, still remain on the board and uh, will recuse myself for that purpose. Madam Chair, before I make a motion, did Brendan want to ask a question before the motion or? Yes, that would be fine, Brendan. Yeah, I just had a question about the uh, GIS services. So are they building uh, like sort of a way for us to uh, collect data from each section and then input that into some kind of database? Is that what we're looking for? Is that the, the is that what it is? Basically, so, yeah. Okay, excellent. Yeah, fourteen thousand dollars not a lot of money for that, but awesome. <laughs> we're working with um, we're working with existing data sets, and again, because of what they do, they have access to hundreds and hundreds of data layers. And so, for us to be able to pull those the the relevant data layers together, and then clip our region instead of having four counties that we glue together in a plan and call that a region, you know, to be able to give you a composite regional picture. Um, and, and that reflects all the different municipalities. So we will we'll probably discover some things we wish we had that we don't have, but it's a starting point. And, and we'll be able to do some basic analyses for, for the region, for our members to be able to help them with mapping. Um, and then we'll see where it goes, but this is a first step. And we think it's sustainable and um, a, a technology that for old dogs like me, it's it still seems new and exotic, but for younger people coming up and along, this is, they, they graduate from high school using this technology. So I think it'll be really good for us. Excellent, yeah, I move to uh, approve the motion as read. Is Second. there a Second. Thank you, Dick, thank you. Um, we have a motion on the floor to approve resolution 01-2021 authorizing a one-year AWC GIS consortium agreement. Um, do we have further discussion on that? Wendy, did you want to weigh in at all on that on behalf of the TAC? Yes, thank you. It was a good subject for the TAC and we're all looking forward to the information that will come out of it. We all participate in Title VI uh, planning and reporting, and it will be very interesting to see a regional composite. And there is a lot of information out there that we can all learn from. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to comment on the discussion? Seeing none, we have a motion on the floor to approve resolution 01-20 Two, one authorizing a one-year AWC GIS consortium service agreement. Is there anyone who would be inclined to vote against that motion? Is there anyone that wants to vote against approval of the motion? Hearing none, the motion passes with unanimous consent. Thank you. And our next agenda item is spending money. Um, we have uh, we have determined that we have about forty five hundred dollars available, and the executive committee asked was very hesitant to give money back. So we ask our administrative um, support Ed and Sarah to find a, a useful means for that money. And so I will let the discussion go to Sarah and Ed. Yeah, thank you again. We're, um, I want to stress that we are, I mean, we're always paying attention to budget because we don't have much budget. You know, we're a small organization and with lean resources, but we operate on a biennium budget basis with funds from the state. And so June 30th, any money left in our budget evaporates. It doesn't carry over to next year. So we're really, really dialing in on this right now, which is why you have so much of it in front of you today. So this particular thing, as we're looking at our budget and being really hard nosed about how this is going to play out, we think that we have about forty-five hundred dollars, and we were saying, well, what, what could this sort of think of it as a one-time investment, like like all of these? What what could we do that would benefit us going forwards and and help make future work more efficient or effective? And and 
uh, late last year, the board um, and the TAC and the board settled on sort of uh, climate response and electric vehicle readiness in that category of uh, an area of, of further, you know, exploration, um, analysis, follow up. And what we realized is that it, it is very much a subject matter expert area and Ed and I are both keenly interested in it and we can track down all kinds of stuff, but somebody who lives and breathes it day in, day out would be able to step in and for what is admittedly for a consultant, not very much money, um, but probably be able to very quickly and efficiently gather, sweep all the information that's relevant for our region from the Kitsap and, and Olympic peninsulas that we can use as a foundation going forward. So what, are, what um, the various plans and study efforts that have been done over the years, any sort of analysis of the grids and what the capacity of the grid is, where we have infrastructure in place already, whether charging stations or um, other, other things that support um, um, electric vehicle readiness, any um, market studies or policy studies that have been done. There's so many different players who have a little piece of this that um, we thought that it would be much more efficient for somebody who knows the medium, knows the players, knows the issue areas to go out, pull everything in, quickly assess it and say, this has value, this has value, this has value, this kind of long in the tooth or the technology has moved on, don't, don't waste your time pursuing that. And, and be able to give us a sense of where we have gaps in our knowledge or in our coordination that would be helpful to PRTPO to know what are the right next steps to take. So use this $4,500 to do that background data and policy collection analysis, assemble it into a usable um, repository of information so that when we begin the next fiscal year, um, state fiscal year, the 2022-2023 um, budget biennium, um, we have this as a starting point instead of using that more limited budget to even do this basic background data collection, which neither Ed nor I are gonna do as efficiently as somebody who works in this arena. So that's what we're coming to you with a proposal for how we think this $4,500 could be spent. Um, again, according to our procurement policy, it's a, it's a micro purchase, but it is a purchase that helps to implement the work program. And so um, we need your approval to even begin our procurement process. And then we will need your approval when we obtain it and get that and get the contract. We will need to come back to you in April to get your approval to execute the agreement. So we'll have a very, very narrow window at the very end of this to actually pull this work off. But that, that's what we're coming to you for. If you approve it today, we'll come back to you in April with um, our selected firm and uh, draft contract language for you to um, review our procurement process and approve that contract. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, that you might I'm have. Gonna, just a point of information here in that we have had for the last um, biennium about $15,000 a year money that is going away. So we're losing about 10% of our budget. And so if we can create um, or develop something at this point, while we still have a little extra money that will help us in the future, that would be good. Um, and so anyway, this is what Sarah and Ed um, are presenting for us. And is there any discussion on that? Lindsay, I'm gonna look at you because I know that you're very interested in um, efficiencies. I don't know that I have any comments, sorry. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Beck, I would like to make a quick comment. Um, I, you know, this is a really strategic thing to do and I appreciate you guys uh, doing this. This is definitely gonna uh, uh, gr help grow our, our future prospects and, and thank you for uh, this idea. It's, it's a great micro strategy and I love it. Thank you, Kate. Yeah, I just want to also uh, support this effort. Um, there have been a number of kind of disparate efforts around electrification, specifically around the kind of loop of the Olympic Peninsula. Um, and 
having an inventory would be really helpful in helping to, you know, just kind of uh, give some base information to those efforts. So very supportive. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Sarah, do you need a motion to move forward? I, we're working through our procurement policy for the first time. I think, uh, I think a motion would probably be appropriate. Okay. Is there anyone who would like to make a motion for our administrative team to move forward and bring back to us in April? Um, to, so I guess the motion is for them to First begin a procurement process for a consolidated electric vehicle um, inventory of data. So and then, this is Kate. Thank you. Is there anyone who would like to second that? I'll second that. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Okay. What will happen is if we're not able to find somebody to do this work, um, we're going to have to let uh, DOT know quickly that we, we will be giving back $4,500. So, um, that's the downside of us not being able to fit it in within that budget. Um, again, is there anyone else who would like to speak to the motion? Okay, um, we will be seeking a vote then on a motion to move forward uh, with procurement for a collection of electrical vehicle data. Is there anyone who would like to vote against that motion? And I offer the opportunity to vote against the motion. Seeing none, uh, the motion proves with unanimous consent. So thank you. I think that gets us through our action items for today. And so now we're going to go down to the more fun stuff and our discussion items and our planning efforts. And we have invited John Winans here today from Olympic Region DOT. And John, I'm assuming you're going to have a few words before we start an interactive discussion. Yeah, I think, I think so. Thank you. We will yeah. turn it over to John. Okay, thanks. I've never been introduced as part of the fun part of the agenda before. That's kind of unique. Thanks for that, Beck. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks for the invitation and the opportunity, it's been too long since uh, I've had a chance to meet with this group and I apologize for that. You know, time flies by us and um, I hope that you have been and well served by Dennis and Joseph and others uh, attending attending these meetings. So, but I wanna, I wanna do just make a few comments. Um, and I, I didn't, you know, I don't have a, a formal presentation but I've been scribbling notes about about a few things I just wanted to touch on. Um, you know, the ledge session is unfolding. Everybody's watching the budget deliberations. I'm sure all of you are watching the budget deliberations. There have been, uh, you know, there's been uh, the House Transportation Chair, Representative Fai, um, his um, committee has released a, a proposal for a, a transportation package that relies heavily on a gas tax increase. Um, the results of that are is sort of apportioned into different programs. There's not a lot of detail yet. Uh, the Senate Transportation Committee under Senator Hobbs has released uh, essentially a, an updated version of a package he um, was interested in advancing last session. It relies on a variety of sources um, and identifies a number of projects. Senator King has talked about potentially releasing some sort of um, uh, whether it's a package or some proposals. Um, his comments that I've heard uh, in the, just recently at a, at a um, Highway Users Federation uh, meeting, uh, he made comments along the lines of it's time to focus on, on preservation and maintenance of our existing system that the legislature has ignored it for too long. And so I expect that whatever uh, Senator King advances or puts on the table will center around maintenance and preservation. And then uh, Senator Saldana is also talking about um, some sort of a package or, or a proposal as well. So there's not a lot of details, but there are things coming out of the legislature. Um, I've also heard uh, a couple of representatives say that they don't believe that it's time for a revenue package, that um, 
that anything that increases a burden on the taxpayers, it's, it's not the right time. So I think there's a lot of discussion still to happen around transportation. I don't know if any of you had a chance to, um, to watch Rogers uh, Millar's, um, our secretary's state of transportation address. If you go to TVW, there's a couple of versions, one he did for the House and one he did for the Senate. And it provides, um, it provides a, a pretty uh, good window into what Roger's thinking on where transportation is going. And um, I, would be, I would be happy at a future meeting to go through that uh, with you, or if you want to take time and, and look at it, I would be happy to come back and participate in a discussion on what you saw and what you thought. So I'll leave that up to you. But he also focuses um, his uh, comments heavily on uh, maintenance and transportation of the existing system that we are only funded to do about half of what um, what we need to as far as maintaining and preserving that what we have today. Uh, it's becoming increasingly burdensome um, to the travelers of the system. And I'll talk in a little shortly uh, in a little bit about a couple of projects coming up that reflect some of those challenges. But um, the other thing that um, we're saying is it's time to step up and and address the um, fish passage culvert. Um, federal injunction that was handed down to the department to replace aging culverts under our highway system that do not adequately uh, provide for the migration of um, essentially salmon and steelhead and and other andromedous fish species that um, um, you know are, live in the state and so that's a somewhere over a three billion dollar investment that's needed we've been working on it for a number of years it's not funded adequately um, and you know I don't know I don't know where that's going either but it's a priority given that there is a federal injunction and 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 um, a lot of what I'm saying I think will probably be notes for questions later but just kind of the main things that are on my uh, plate right now I think um, we have a long way to go yet in the session I, I don't know when we're going to start to see details and when the the house and the senate will be ready to uh, go into conference with the governor's uh, staff and negotiate a compromise budget, but we're we're probably a month or so away from from anything like that, I would guess. Um, there's a number of projects that you may want to talk about today, um, whether it's uh, what are we doing about fish passage? We currently have uh, state route one twelve closed. Um, there are there are five major um, points on that route in about an eight mile section that we have had uh, heavy damage due to slides and we're working on on uh, reopening that highway we have uh, we're still working on getting the Elwell River bridge replacement we are hoping and will we will reconvene stakeholders in the swim area to talk about uh, what to do um, with the proposal to complete the Simdars interchange and make improvements from Simdars out through the area around um, you know, Happy Valley and White Feather and Palo Alto. There's some work needed there and there's some money to do some design work and we wanna continue. We, we've had one meeting with stakeholders. We're committed to continuing that process and, and coming up with uh, a solution to put on the table um, to address issues through there. Oh, we've, uh, we're still working on the, um, it, the, the uh, intersections that, on uh, 104 at Shine and SR 119. We've had a number of public meetings about that and we're advancing some design work on, on those projects. So there are, there are a number of things there. And then of course, I think there are uh, questions and I would like to have some uh, feedback and conversations on the whole uh, concept of the investment strategy uh, group that is convening with all of the MPOs, RTPOs and the department around the state and I'll just introduce from my perspective that, that that conversation started, oh, a couple of years ago when Roger uh, Millar uh, said, told um, a group of us who, uh, at the time it was the strategic plan round people meeting that he convened, but it's, it's the regional administrators from around the state and um, senior leaders in our planning and design uh, areas. Uh, and he, he challenged that group to uh, work on a process that would lead towards uh, a concept that he described as our plan is your plan. 
from whatever side of the table you're looking at to where the transportation plan that the, that the DOT advanced was uh, in lockstep with the various plans that the MPOs and RTBOs and local agencies put forward. That's a huge lift, but I think it's a, a noble aspiration, I guess is some of the words I would use. Um, that, um, that we've been talking about challenges on our system. Uh, there's uh, some examples around the states of where, uh, the state of where, for instance, uh, um, a, a traffic issue in the, the classic example Roger, Roger has used for a while is do we build a $400 million interchange in Spokane or do we spend $40 million on the local roadway system in Spokane because they both produce the same uh, result for travelers? Well, um, we would advocate for money going to the local system. Um, it saves a lot of money and it provides the same benefit to travelers. Uh, essentially, it, it provides an alternative to that access point on the on the state system. So that's just one example of where I think that there's um, we're advocates of uh, address the problem. Um, and it doesn't matter where it is, whose system, if it fixes the problem, then we've accomplished our goal. So my uh, I will tell you, I don't um, I don't know what the answer looks like for investment strategies because there are so, the investment strategy question. And uh, I'm interested in your perspective. The, the meetings to date, um, I think uh, in my mind, um, I was hoping we'd be a lot further along in this conversation. Um, I think that we almost immediately were confronted with an issue of trust um, and understanding each other's priorities and on, um, you know, struggling a little bit to come up with a, what conversations do we even need to have before we can embark on a solution? I'm not sure we've identified the problem. And so um, uh, that is one of the issues before us. And then the other issue before us is, uh, frankly, in my mind, is, a, is a, an outstanding issue of equity. Um, what does equity look like in this plan? Um, and I will tell you that the regional administrators are carrying this foot message forward uh, to headquarters and saying that um, that the there needs to be equity in the decisions we're making as we continue to look at things like um, um, the shortfalls in our maintenance and preservation budget. The answer is not to put all the money on the high volume routes in the urbanized areas. The answer is to take an equitable look at where the issues are and, and um, make sure that we are, we are um, taking into account where, where those needs really are and how do you approach that in an equitable way. And so, again, I don't have the answer, but I'm, I'm, I'm in the, you know, trying to get out in the, in the forefront of saying we need to have that conversation and, and we need to make sure we understand what it is we're, we're doing and the, um, you know, they're, there are some small routes in uh, the Olympic region, which uh, I think most of you know, but the, Olymp so the Olympic region is Pierce County, Thurston County, and the Kitsap and Olympic Peninsulas. And there are a lot of routes in, in our region that are small, but um, they, um, they, the people that live and work and do business in those areas depend on those small routes heavily. And um, State Row 112, is a great example. A State Route 112 is a nightmare to keep open, to keep it maintained and preserved, quite frankly. But 101 and uh, 112 are the only links between the east and west side of the Olympic Peninsula. Um, and, and we need to, in my mind, they both need to be, um, they both need to be kept in a condition that if one goes down, the other is available. And so, you know, that's just, it's a very, 112 is a very small and low volume route. And yet um, we've been advocating, as a matter of fact, as recently as yesterday, I've been, um, you know, looking at and advocating for and got concurrence from the secretary that we are going to uh, proceed and, and get those repairs done and get that route open. But I can tell you that it was a conversation that took some work because if you strictly look at the volume of that roadway, there are people who are not familiar with the situation that will say, why would we spend $4 million 
when you can go around either end and still get around and um, when the volume is so low. And if you look strictly at the numbers, that's a case to be made, but you can't look straightly uh, just at the numbers. And Roger has agreed um, with, with me, with us, that um, it, it's not appropriate to do that. This is, you have to look at the context of, of the problem and the context of the situation. And so I think that's a similar discussion that we have to apply as we go forward in the investment strategy conversation. So um, I'm gonna leave it at that because I know there's questions and I wanna make sure that we have plenty of time. That's just a little sort of intro into where my head's at right now on a few things. So I'll turn it back to you, Beck, to facilitate the discussion. Thank you. And I know you brought a lot up. Thank you very much. Um, a lot of important information for us. I, I do want to say a few things up front, and then I'm going to open it up to the group. I also want to acknowledge that we had some additional members join us. Debbie Clemens, which we haven't seen for a year. We're so glad you're here. And Penny from Squaxin is with us. And Rob Gelder from the uh, Kitsap County was here. I'm not sure I'm seeing him now. So we do have some additional members of our board. But the first thing I wanted to talk to you, John, about is the investment strategy group. And I'm going to speak as chair of the RPTO um, for my first few comments. And our group had made the decision in December not to continue sending Thera to those meetings because of the, the progress that was being made and the reduction in our revenue for next year. It, we were not finding value. And so our request to you is because you do attend those, if you could be our eyes and ears and let us know, but financially it's just very difficult for us to send someone there. Um, when this investment strategy committee started, we were given four questions um, from DOT to answer. And we put out a survey to our membership. And those questions were, how well is the current transportation funding system working for us? And what would we do to improve it? What keeps us up all night? And then were we interested in being part of the committee? And the responses we received from our jurisdictions, not one of them, not one response made any mention to the competitiveness or the prioritization of awards. They indicated um, very definitely that the issue was there just wasn't enough money and there's not enough money for preservation and maintenance. And, and, and how do we do that? And then we were also, when we um, started attending, Thera started attending, we were given a schedule and the RPTO was to have received uh, a briefing in, or a summary, uh, a checkpoint, if you will, in October, November, and December as to the progress of the committee. And we have not had an official um, recap yet. The recap that was sent out to our executive board was pulled from the meeting packet of the um, quarterly MPO RTPO meeting. So we feel like our boards have not have input into the process that, that you're undertaking, um, particularly, um, you know, your problem statement, the vision, all of these things. The electeds have not had any input at all. It's just, it's just the technical folks. And we had anticipated that our input was going to be valued and um, welcomed, and that has not been the case. I want so we'll open that up. Um, the other thing I want to say is in that strategy, one of the things they talk about under number one is prioritization. And the RCW does not, under our duties, it does not list us prioritizing any projects 
we have never prioritized projects. Um, and I don't know what funding sources there would be asking us to prioritize. Is that just something out of a state transportation package? Or is it TIB and crab money? Is it federal money? What, what do they want us to prioritize? And how often do they want us to prioritize it? And do they want a standard um, evaluation for prioritization across the state? I think if this moves forward, a, there's a lot of additional work to do. Now, I made those comments on behalf and as chair of the RPTO. And now as Port Orchard City Council person, I'm gonna say something else. And I'm gonna start with the problem statement. And from my point of view personally, you've got the problem statement wrong. The problem statement, and I'm not gonna read it now, but the problem statement as I see it, and I, don't, I have no idea the background, I, I do not know. But I've heard Roger Millar speak several times. And what I see as the real problem is DOT is not at the table when transportation um, funding packages or revenue packages are being put together. DOT is not at the table with the House Transportation Committee or the Senate Transportation Committee to bring these things forward. And it seems to me that's where we need to start. Um, and again, that's just my obser that's my observation. The other thing that we have heard repetitively from our group is sustainable funding is important for our preservation and maintenance projects. And the group, the investment strategy group is, is not working on revenue at all. And the revenue side is key. That's where we really need some buy-in. So that's what I wanna say. Um, those were the things that are on my mind. And I don't know how many of you've had an opportunity to read the summary that was sent out yesterday. Um, but it does indicate that the regions will be prioritizing um, projects to be forward. And we don't know if that's our entire tip or we have none of those definitions are there yet. And John brought up a lot of other interesting um, points for us to discuss. 112 is a big thing. I know in Kitsap, um, the Gorst Interchange is a big thing. But we will open it up for discussion. So if there's anyone who would like to either ask John questions or provide input to John, we sure would welcome that. It, Pat, can I just add one thing? And that would be, uh, you, you, that was great. That was very well stated. And I think when you said a uh, sustainable funding source, we also need it to be predictable. Yeah, yeah the revenue side is critical, John. Um, yeah. I haven't heard any of us say, gee, we're not getting our fair share out of a competitive process. What we're hearing is we need, the city of Port Orchard um, through last October, our gas tax revenue was down 20%. Yeah. Um, you know, and th the packages that they're looking at doesn't do anything for local jurisdictions increasing their gas tax revenue. Yeah, I, and I agree. I know Lindsay uh, has a hand up, but can I, uh, let me just make a couple, Lindsay, and make a couple of comments first, just because Beck, I was madly making notes because you raised some really good points and, and asked some really good questions. And I think, I think one of the reasons that we're not further along in the investment strategy discussion, and you're right, we're not, and you had, ex you're, we're expecting more, is that this, um, I think that there was, you know, just crafting the problem state, may, statement with a group like we had, as you can well imagine, between the department and six regional administrators from all around the state, and then MPOs and RTEPOs from all around the state. Uh, Thera watched the, it all unfold as well and participated um, um, bravely, but there was just a um, it, it was just extremely difficult to even get a problem statement. We had subcommittees and Oh, frankly, and I know this is being recorded, but frankly, it was a nightmare. I mean, it was just, it just really, it just really brought out the diversity of needs and opinions and, and ideas on what the real problem is. And then how do you get into things like revenue? And, and so, you know, ultimately, when we talk about prioritizing, um, I think that, that the goal is, from, from my perspective, 
Uh, part of the goal is the, the sustainable revenue source and the move away from packages that come with lists of projects that maybe um, you know, you've, you've waited uh, you know, eight years for another transportation package and you're going out and you're trying to get a couple of projects done through this. And you know that if you don't get it, you're gonna wait another eight years or so. It's, it's just, it's very hard. And um, you know, pre the nickel package, um, we worked on a priority programming basis that I would really like to see a return to myself to where, to where if we get to a point as a group, it's okay. So the, this is what the revenue looks like. There's, um, and for this biennium, we've got this much allocated for preservation and this much allocated for safety and this much allocated for, um, for mobility, um, for capacity. And uh, what are what around the state? What are the department and the local needs for capacity improvement? And and finding some way to say in an equitable way, in this two year cycle, we're going to fund these capacity projects around the state, on and off the state system. The state system transit would transition, and ideally, to me, to something that was bigger than just the state highway system. And so. That's a huge lift. I mean, it's a huge lift, and and that that's that to me is one of the biggest difficulties um, here. So, you know, I I think that, uh, but I I agree. I can't argue with anything you said. As a matter of fact, I agree with that. It's it's not moving as fast. It's just defining defining the problem statement was was very difficult, and and revenue is absolutely is absolutely um, an issue. You know, we're similarly uh, early in the COVID uh, outbreak um, under the governor's stay home order, uh, we were, we were um, losing, if that's the right way to put it, about $100 million a month in revenue. Um, and so we currently are going into the 21-23 biennium with the legislature looking at a $720 million ish hole in the department's budget. Um, so they, you know, that's, that's going to put a big, that's a big, um, that's a big ask for them. And, the, and you're right, we don't necessarily get consulted by the committees. We're not at the table. Uh, we do that through the governor's budget. Um, we participate and with the governor's office and they carry a budget to those committees. They do ask us for opinions. They call us and ask us questions, but how do you develop that in a really collaborative manner is another question. So anyway, Lindsay, I know you had your hand up patiently. Yeah, go ahead, Lindsay. Thanks, John. And John, I really appreciate everything you said there. Um, I'm relatively new to understanding or not understanding policy uh, around budgeting for transportation and all that. So if I'm speaking out of turn, plus, please, please pull me back in. Um, one of the challenges I see at the city level is that we, um, we don't really account for our deferred maintenance costs and how much that really is. Um, we had a couple of public works directors at Port Angeles who just said, trust me, we're doing fine on deferred maintenance. And finally, we have a public works director who's saying, yeah, no, we have a really big problem here with deferred maintenance for streets. And um, you know, so, so it, it took somebody willing to say there's a problem um, and not just kick the can down the road. Um, the state doesn't hold us accountable. The state auditor's office does not consider deferred maintenance when assessing whether we have a balanced general fund budget. So our general fund in Port Angeles pays for fire, streets, uh, police, and parks and rec. Fire department budgets, police department budgets are mostly personnel. So that has to be accounted for within the fiscal year. Uh, but maintenance of infrastructure like streets and also like playgrounds and stuff for parks and rec, that can be pushed out to subsequent years in order to balance the budget. And that's what the city of Port Angeles has been doing. The auditor comes in and says, congratulations, you have a balanced budget. You even actually have fiscal sustainability based on your fiscal policies, but they're not looking at deferred maintenance. I expressly asked the auditor in our entrance interview last time around, like, what about deferred maintenance? And they said they consider that a policy decision by the local government. 
So we just don't have like, unless we have staff who are willing to say, this is a huge problem. We wanna put the extra time in to figuring out how to solve it. No one's holding us accountable to that. Uh, I did post in the chat the, uh, a link to a transcript and the video link that's in that, in that document to a February 4th presentation that uh, Chuck Marone gave in Jefferson County. Well, I mean, in Jefferson County, uh, to the Jefferson County um, Collaborative Government Group. I, I apologize, I can't remember the exact name, uh, which I think was a really good presentation on, on the big picture of urban development and where we're at in financing infrastructure, uh, particularly streets. Um, he talks about, I, I don't know if he coined it, but the Ponzi scheme of, of urban development. Uh, and I think that that's ultimately driving a lot of our challenges in funding and financing uh, all the infrastructure we have to do for transportation and other areas as well. But I think transportation is where the rubber really meets the road. So I, I highly encourage that discussion. And I'm thankful for that we're talking systemically about these things. Thank you all. Yeah, the whole issue of deferred maintenance is huge. And I know it's huge for everybody in here who's involved in public works that, and in the transportation budget, you know, the move towards uh, the TPA package that did the nine and a half cent gas tax, then the Connecting Washington package, they funded a lot of projects, um, a lot of projects, many of which were needed, but they came with no additional maintenance money. Um, you know, we've we've added we've added something like I'll, I'll get the numbers wrong, but they're on the order of we've increased the number of um, of uh, devices that we have for ITS cameras, signs, reader boards, signal systems, all those things. We've doubled the number, more than doubled the number of those we have um, in the last ten years or so, and we're working with actually fewer staff and less budget to maintain them than we had. Now that we have twice as many. It's just not sustainable. And, and uh, all, all of those various things are gonna come down around us sooner or later. I'm going to call on Mr. Clausen. Do you have anything you wanna say? Because I know you were very involved, um, at least at the city of Port Orchard putting on your other hat about maintenance. And I don't know if transit um, has any similar issues. Well, yes, we do. Um, I think Lindsay covered it very, very well and captured the essence of cities. But, you know, transit, we have the same thing. We've got most of ours is equipment, uh, but we are starting to get an emphasis coming on with state of good repair efforts. And we have to justify um, not only with DOT, but FTA and what we're doing. So we're kind of unlike cities where we can make a policy decision and ignore it. Uh, we're kind of having our feet held to the fire a little bit. So, and a lot of it is coming from some of the larger legacy systems. If you can imagine um, the light rail system or the rail system in New York City and how many years it's been operating without any maintenance um, of the structures for their, their track, Chicago, some of those, Boston, now they're spending many, many, many dollars, and in some cases having to shut down portions um, to deal with the deferred maintenance. So I agree with you, John, it's an issue. It's an issue across the board. As I said, I think Lindsay captured it very well in trying to, there just isn't enough money, it's just the bottom line. And there's not a lot of options available for cities. Um, you know, the Transportation Benefit District helped a little bit and we kind of put it on hold while Mr. Iman did his thing. Uh, nobody really likes to pay license tabs. I wish I had a crystal ball or the, the, the right answer, but like all of us, I can certainly spouse the challenges that we face. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, increasingly what we're what we're talking about, uh, and I and I will say that I am. This is the, this is the first block of time pre legislative session, and as we go into session, that I have heard uh, legislators really saying we need to get on maintenance and, and and preservation. We need to do something. We have waited too long. We have pushed this, kicked this can down the road. Um, 
and and um, so that's good. The the other message really is that um, it's not a matter of it's not a matter to me. It's it's gone beyond a matter of simply well we need to do some widening and we need to do this because it's going to encourage economic development and economic growth, and that's all true. But we're at a point where if if we continue to ignore the present preservation of the existing system, as that increasingly starts to fail on us, that is a bigger impact to the economic well-being of our communities than not having a new lane somewhere. If the existing system ceases to serve those communities adequately, it's a bigger problem than we're not expanding that system. Uh, and that's becoming especially true, uh, at least more vocally in some of the rural areas on the east side. Um, and, and, you know, the policies of things like we're not going to pave roads um, that are signed under 45 miles an hour, we're not going to pave ramps, and we're not going to chip seal routes. Those are some of the things that we're looking at implementing and have started implementing because of the lack of funds to maintain the system. And those are, those are, bad, those are bad things for economic health of, of communities in my mind, so. John, John I, would, I would echo your comment about this legislative session and, and I really have to compliment Chair Fai at the, on the House Transportation. He did, I don't know how many listening sessions with various interest groups to try to assess, you know, what the, the challenges and focused a lot primarily around funding. And I, I'm pretty impressed with the work that he and his committee did. Now we'll see what comes out of the full legislature, yeah. but at least they're addressing, as you say, they're starting to talk about, we've got to take care of what we have. I agree. John, is there any particular way that um, the Peninsula RPTO and your Olympic Region Group can work, to, work together um, to help solve some of our issues? And what um, would that look like? Is that something we need a discussion offline to figure out how we can, you know, because we're partners in this and, and how can we all have state highways going through our jurisdictions. Um, and, and then we have, you know, our local roads that we have to get to your state highways. Um, so is there a way that we can work together? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think I think the way to work together is making sure, you know, so I was going to say is to make sure we do understand each other's needs, which I think we have, we have a fairly good grasp of the, um, the few, you know, if the future held, um, you know, the, the goal of the investment strategy uh, group, the Rogers vision would be that, that, you know, we would, um, we would approach the legislature and say together, hey, this is, these are our needs and we agree. The, you know, the entire peninsula, both peninsulas um, agree and the DOT agrees, here's, here's what we need. This is a plan. And based on the, the ultimate goal of its priority programming, say here are our top needs and why. Um, and this is what we, what we would do with with the money kind of a thing. Um, I think the start to that is, is um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna to continue to, to represent you at the investment strategy discussions. And I, at, in a conversation I had with Thera, I said, look, I'm, you know, I understand um, your uh, board's position on this. I will continue to forward you the information and, and I will continue to understand your concerns and I will carry those to the group. And at such time as I think there's a benefit to you jumping back at the table, you know, to the table, um, I will make sure you know that, that I think that there's a benefit to you being there. I, I think there is no matter what, but I understand your position. I do. So, um, Andrew, you, um, you've had your hand up and I ignored it. I apologize for that. Sorry, Beck, I just had a follow on question, but I didn't want to interrupt the conversation that's uh, going on now because my question for John is, is a little bit unrelated to the investment strategy group. So but that's fine. Yeah. It's 
John opened up a, a whole menu of things to talk about when he first started. So go ahead. All right. John, I was wondering if you might comment on uh, the impacts to Olympic Region and your staff, um, not only with the current um, uh, budgetary concerns, but also the COVID impact. You know, we depend a lot on your staff um, to not only execute your projects, but to execute our projects as well. And, and I, I think I'm seeing some stress and pressure within your staff to, um, you know, get the work done. So our, our furloughs and hiring freezes and other impacts um, impacting you and, and, and is there ways that we can help that? Well, that's a, yeah, that's a, you know, that's a great question, Andy. And, and the answer is absolutely, uh, we're being impacted. Our, now our maintenance forces are back at work. Uh, you know, we were all sent home for about eight weeks, you know, six to eight weeks. Um, but we are back to doing construction. Uh, the construction forces are back. Our construction teams are back in the field. Our maintenance forces are back in the field. Now our maintenance forces are, are um, you know, we're working somewhat more inefficiently because we can't carpool to job sites. So if we have, if normally we would send two trucks with uh, six workers in them, we're now sending six workers in six trucks because of the, the guidelines, the state guidelines we have to operate under for, for distancing and, and, and how much time you can spend. You know, you can get in a vehicle with a certain kind of mask on for an hour, but that's it. And there are many places it takes more than an hour to get from the shed to the work site in the Olympic region, as you all know. Uh, so we're, we're working, it's a little more inefficient, but we are working, our office workers are, and our office teams are all working remotely. We're all working from home. I've been teleworking since March 16th, I think. Um, but the, the, the stress, I've been having quite a few conversations with my uh, leadership team about the signs of stress and burnout that I'm seeing in our staff. And it, it's getting very noticeable. We've, uh, we've got a lot of retirements. We, we've been talking about the gray tsunami hitting us for a while. Well, it started about three months ago, uh, four months ago, maybe, and it's hitting us at a, at a hard. Um, I think between, between the COVID conditions and uh, the upcoming furloughs, uh, the reduction in pay that's gonna cause, I think a lot of people who are hanging around because they liked the job are saying it's, it's just not worth it anymore. Um, the hiring freeze has hit us hard. Uh, we've got people doing two jobs. I can't remember the last time that I promoted somebody without telling them that congratulations, you're now the manager, but you still have to do your old job. I mean, that's, that's just the norm anymore. We're, we are, we're just not filling, backfilling positions. Uh, we're not bringing in new blood. We're kind of shuffling around the people we have. And uh, it's affecting project delivery. Um, you know, the, uh, some of the projects that uh, we have, we're having to set aside and say, this is gonna be delayed. Um, it's hit us pretty hard in the winter. I mean, you know, January was a brutal month as you, you know, out in the peninsula. Um, the, we put in for emergency funds and the declaration from FHWA, it was, it was just another Northwest winter. It, it wasn't an emergency. And it's like, well, we had 14 or 16 different highway closures at one point in January, and we still got about six of them closed. Um, most of a hill along 109 uh, came down. Um, and so, you know, it's really hasn't been normal, but we don't have the ability anymore to say, go and work on that emergency work and shuffle your staff around uh, and keep developing those projects. So yeah, we're, we're hit hard. And, and, you know, what you can do uh, to help is, um, you know, it's, it's understand that as, as we're working on projects for you, the 305 corridor projects, that uh, we may not be able to do as much uh, right now as we were in the past. We'll, we're gonna keep pushing stuff out. We, we have the ability, we're still running the existing consultant contracts that we have out 
uh, but we're not issuing any new ones until we see what the budget uh, what the budget looks like. So, in, yeah. In the interest of time, um, I, Brandon, I see you have your hand up. I'd like to call on you, and then that may be our last last question, unless someone has something pressing. Because I would like to make sure we um, have an opportunity to look at the rest of our agenda. So, Brendan, go ahead. No, yeah, I just wanted to just quickly comment. Like, it's so disappointing to hear the, um, you know, they're taking the austerity approach. Um, you know, there's so much innovation um, coming in the way of, of public transportation or, or regional transportation. There's many other countries, you know, doing extraordinary things. Um, so, it, 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 in this time, it's just disappointing to hear that they're taking. Uh, you know, more of an austerity approach. That's that's all, all I wanted to say. Thank you. Is there anyone else for one last comment to John? If not, John, we appreciate your generous amount of time you gave us this morning and listening to all of our action items before we got to your discussion. Um, appreciate the work and effort that DOT does on behalf of all of our jurisdictions. So, and you're welcome to stay for the rest of our meeting. Um, no, but we appreciate very much you being here. Okay, thank you. And and um, it won't be as long as it was since last time that I was here. So, well, um, I since DOT quit being our lead planning agency, we used to have as many DOT folks at our meeting <laughs> as executive board, and now you know now it's usually just Dennis. So, um, yeah. and for those of you who do, do not see her on your screen, Debbie Clemens is here today representing Dennis and. Um, Anyway, I just wanted to make note of that. We haven't seen her for a long time either. So I, I do want to make it clear though that we do appreciate Dennis. Okay, oh, good. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, so Thera, we will move now to the kickoff of our um, UPWP. And I would we've got a few more agenda items, but I will let you know we're running, um, what, about 15 minutes behind the um, agenda times, so. Gotcha, gotcha. We, can, we can tighten it up here. Um, this next item is, is just more of a briefing discussion for you all. Um, again, budget, we're thinking about budget this time of year um, from all different aspects. We are launching the, um, the development of the 2022-2023 um, Unified Planning Work Program, or UPWP for the new members. This is our budget and work plan. Um, we are a couple of quick things to point out to you. Um, this, uh, this year, state fiscal year 2021, we're operating on a one year, we, we put together a one year work plan um, for various reasons. We're going to, um, your next work plan will be a two year work plan. So we're gonna go ahead and make it for the entire um, biennium. Um, as Beck alluded to earlier, uh, uh, we are going into this um, next biennium with a budget that is about $30,000 um, less than the budget that we have um, that we had this year. Um, there was some one-time funding boost in this current biennium that we won't have going forwards, but we've, we knew that this time last year when we were building our budget. And so what we tried to do was build a budget that is sustainable at this level of funding that we're going into. So um, we don't expect there to be huge um, impacts on things. One thing I will say that is different than what um, was in the staff report that went out, we just learned yesterday, and I don't have a lot of details, but I will say that um, whereas in the staff report, um, I said that we, you know, we set our dollar amount, it appears that we will have an additional $80,000 um, to support our human services transportation planning work over this next biennium. So when I come back to you in April, I will have more details of that that I can provide. But um, I think in a nutshell, we, we're going with the same sort of a work plan structure that we have been using this year, which puts the sort of the activities that PRTPO must do in order to meet its state requirements. Um, we put those activities into sort of the tasks one, two, and three, or work areas one, two, and three. And then we save this fourth work element for activities that you all as a board really have a chance to identify. I'm going to, I'm going to use the word discretionary, but more uh, uh, regionally directed activities that are above and beyond the bare minimum requirements. 
And so we um, will have some additional capacity that I wasn't aware of when I sent this out last Friday. Um, it's the way things are with budgets sometimes constantly moving targets. We will come back to you in April with a draft work plan that uh, uh, takes these various requirements that we must do as an RTPO, um, uh, the, mo the momentum on you know, ongoing programs that we already have that are just gonna roll right into the next year. We'll bring that to you in a format for you to look at and work on and help us refine. We'll make any final changes to that, send it to the state for their review. And then we will be bringing that back to you in June for your final review and approval. And then it would go into effect July 1. So um, I just wanted to give you that background before we go into that process. You will actually have something substantive to talk about on this in April, but I wanted to kick it off with you this month and answer any questions that you might have. I'm pretty excited to do a two year UPWP so that we don't have to do it every year. I think you're gonna find that it fits the flow of the work in a more natural way. I, I think you're really gonna like it a lot, so. And then do you want to, um, you did a nice job of getting us closer to schedule. Do you wanna talk about our year end activities? Um, yeah. Is to, just to keep you all in the loop, we have a couple of things in our work plan that we have not started yet that we have committed to complete by the end of this fiscal year. And so um, we are going to, over the next few months, we will be uh, updating our public participation plan and our Title VI plan. Our Title VI plan is, um, it's, it's a federal requirement. It, it is a very regulatory thing. Um, it, it must accomplish certain things for the feds, must be formatted in a particular way. Put up with it, please. <laughs> we will bring that to you in June as a draft. We'll be doing a lot, we'll have a lot of data analysis that goes into it. The public participation plan is the more, um, it, that's the nice thing that you can do. You know, like you must do this. This other one is you have a lot more discretion over how to format that. We will bring that to you in April, a draft plan for you to, to look at. And I'll, I'll just share that going into it, as Ed and I were talking yesterday, we see this as like the public participation plan, like back in the era when we were, you know, when we when that was developed, it was sort of public participation was um, here is how you public can participate in our process. And what we'd like to do based on where we think you are as an organization today is frame it more as a community engagement plan. How will PRTPO um, seek to engage its you know, various stakeholders in the community and different activities? And I think coming hot off the heels of the consolidated grants process and getting to start to work with some of our uh, really important uh, social service transportation providers in the community, there's an opportunity in that public participation plan to strengthen that the importance of that ongoing communication and also we'll, we look forward to bringing that to you we'll bring the draft of that to you in april and the final um with your revisions we'll bring the final back to you in june for approval and in june we will bring to you the draft title six plan for approval probably in august um, which is totally fine but I just wanted to share that with you in case any of you are looking at the upwp and going like okay we've done this and this and this and this but what about these other things? So those are the two big things. And then the Title VI in particular, we get to take advantage of some of the GIS tools. Um, that'll be our first chance to start using some of those GIS tools to create a, a composite picture for the region and not just say, here's this county, this county, this county, and this county. So um, happy to answer any questions that you might have about those, but just wanted to close the loop there on the accountability and let you know that we do have some more things that will wrap up this year. Thank you. Um, our next agenda item is legislative updates. I don't know if anyone has been following the legislature. I know that John gave us a little bit of background, but is there anything else that anyone wants to talk about um, that's coming out of Olympia? I will, um, I took some notes um, and AWC had their legislative days last week, and I listened to a session um, 
that representatives Faye and Barkas did. And these are just the notes that I wrote from that. Um, one of the things that representative Faye said is he said that if there was not a revenue package coming out of Olympia, that he would anticipate cuts to connecting Washington projects. So I think that um, sounded important to me, so I wrote it down. He also said that the state needs to fund projects that are too large for jurisdictions. We have, and again, this goes back to that prioritization um, that we were talking with, with Mr. Winans. And there are just projects that we can't get funded uh, through TIB or through CRAB or through our federal dollars. And we've heard, um, David Garlington tell us many times how what it took for SQUIM to cobble together their funding for one of their projects. And I know Port Orchard did the same. And it was nice to hear um, Representative Faye recognize that if there are projects that just require a state package for completion. The other thing he said that I wrote down is that we have an established process for the evaluation of projects and that prioritization. And then below that, I wrote down that funds would be going into TIB and CRAB. I do not know, I did not understand um, from the, the house package as it is right now, because he had, it's all about revenue. Um, and I didn't know if there were gonna, if there was actually gonna be a project list for um, you know, projects, or if, if, if he was just putting additional funds into our otherwise competitive processes. John, have you heard anything about that or paid attention to that? Well, I, I do know that Senator Hobbs and his package came to the, what? to the legislature with a list of projects and uh, Chair Fai did not, but now he's asking his members to provide lists, and I, he had a deadline, and honestly, I forgot what that deadline was, but uh, I think John just come back on, maybe you know. Yeah. I think you're, you're right, John. He's, his initial release was listed, you know, some programs and some generalities about it, but I think that he will have a project list. Yeah. Uh, he will have a project list of some sort, but I, I also anticipate that his package fully funds uh, um, I heard will fully fund the culvert issue as well as a number of other projects of importance around the state. Yeah, that's pretty much what I heard as well. And yeah. this list of projects to be very candid is buying votes from his members. So, so if you got a project, get a hold of your representative. That's just what I was thinking. <laughs> but I don't know what the deadline is. <laughs> Does anyone else have any, um, Lindsay, you were probably involved with AWC. Was there any legislative information you'd like to bring forward? I can't think of anything specific for this group. I did attend city action days um, and uh, with transportation, I'm not sure I have anything more to add. Okay. Okay, with that, we can move down to our next um, agenda item, which Sarah would be your report. Okay, um, this is the coordinator's report and uh, just for the benefit of the new members, this is something that um, I include with the executive board agenda, um, every packet, and it's just other stuff that's going on, either stuff that Ed and I were doing, you know, or really mostly me doing um, um, in, in between meetings, but also links to other things that are going on in transportation that might be of interest. And so you'll always see it, um, it's just very, typically pretty short and um, importantly, it has links to um, additional resources or information and it's formatted in a way so that you can um, easily share it if you need to share it with um, staff members or colleagues. So it's easy to pick off and send and stand on its own. A uh, couple of things uh, to point out, John Winans had referenced um, Secretary Millar's 2021 state of transportation update and there is uh, a link to that in the coordinator's report. 
um, this month. And as it occurs to me, I'll, I'll, we'll put a link to that on the website as well, just to make the website more useful. So we'll get that online. Um, the other thing I would say is that uh, uh, in, it's in here. I want to stress with everybody that if you, um, your staff, when they're putting together grant applications, be sure to um, encourage them to use Ed and I as a resource, whether it is, you know, if just to have a second set of eyes, you know, proofing it, looking over, providing input on how the project is consistent with the art regional transportation plan, that's often helpful, or um, certainly letters of support if you're going in for a statewide competitive process to have letters of support from the region will be beneficial for most of the competitive processes out there, or even just to bounce ideas to if, you know, maybe if they're weighing and they're trying to think through, is this the right funding source for this project? We're really helpful to, you know, um, happy to help sit in on that and, and share ideas and just, you know, bring, bring the various perspectives that we have on this to them. I, I have a lot of grant writing experience. I've secured about $80 million in grants for projects over the years and have written for a variety of audiences. And there's just a certain thing, you know, if you write grants all the time, um, you just learn some tricks about how to, how to, you know, target the application to what the, the app, uh, the grantor is asking for. So please use us. We're, the more we can help you, bring resources home to the region, the better everybody is. So this is part of the benefit of being a member. Um, and then uh, the resource manual, again, for new members, we um, last year we began creating a, a, a PRTPO resource manual and it's available. I think I've got a link to it in the um, in, on the agenda. It's easy to find on the website. And this is sort of a one-stop repository. I personally probably use it more than anybody. I just download it to my desktop. And, and it's got everything in there, our bylaws, our members, contact information for members, contacts for Ed and I, meeting schedule, links to all, all the documents that we produce, the UPWP is in there. So it is the, the, and we update it periodically throughout the year as we get new information. So I just wanted to point that out to everybody, the 2021 resource manual is out. And um, I would just close by saying with our new members and any, and if you've got new staff, we're really ha happy to do an orientation kind of thing. RTPOs are odd entities. They're just not like anything else that's out there. And so um, if you're new to the board or if you have new staff that are maybe being involved with attack or you want them to know more about what PRTPO is and what it isn't, please get in touch with either Ed or me. We'd be really happy to set up a meeting either with you or you and your staff to help answer any questions you might have and figure out how quick, you know, help you get settled in as fast as possible and figure out how to bring the right energies to, you know, to what it is that PRTPO is and can do so that we can be most effective. So I think I'll just leave it with that, Beck, um, and unless anybody has any specific questions. Is there any questions for Thera? Okay, with that, um, I am looking at the participants and was going to ask for public comment. I'm not sure I see public. I haven't Any, seen anybody log in today who wasn't uh, one can, of our Right, but we will call for public comment if there is anyone out there that I'm missing. And hearing none, we will move then to just um, a good of the order, um, give everyone an opportunity. Is there anything that we've not brought up today that you would like to talk about? If there's anything in your jurisdiction that you believe um, would benefit the rest of us from knowing, um, please now would be a good time to, to offer us a good of the order. Down sunshine. I'm not seeing anyone. Oh, there, I just heard my... there you go, Wendy. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Hi, I, I wanted to bring up that um, in Jefferson County, I participated in a uh, presentation with the Jamestown Slalom Tribe uh, Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, and it was very elucidating and new territory for me. And I wanted to recommend that um, those resources are available to us um, through Jamestown Squallum Tribe and perhaps others, and that they're very willing to help any day, any time, if you just pick up the phone and call them, 
if you see anything suspect in your jurisdiction that might be a culturally modified tree, might be a scattering of rocks that looks out of character and are probably our most well-known um, feature is shell middens that the Jamestown Salem tribe and other tribes would like to jump in there and examine anything that we're doing in terms of road maintenance or any of our projects that disturb the soil. Thanks, Beck. Kate, I noticed that you came on. Were you wanting to comment? Yeah, comment and or question. Um, I think part of the what I'm excited about in working with this group is an opportunity to hear from other jurisdictions on uh, regional um, progress on regional projects. And um, so I guess kind of curious, like is is there an opportunity for us to be kind of cross pollinating um, some of those announcements or ideas? Um, is this the appropriate time where something like that would happen? Just curious. I would say for today, this would be a very good time for that to happen. And I would also say that we will take that and weave it into our agenda because I do think that networking is an important element of our work. Great, yeah, and so just, I'll just, you know, and you might be, many of you might be familiar with these, but, um, you know, great to see that uh, two Olympic Discovery Trail projects ranked so high in the RCO uh, funding. Um, and so feel optimistic that uh, is it the Forks to La Push section we'll has see some progress and then also our uh, next section in the Jefferson County piece. Um, and um, excited to be working with our transit agency and looking at uh, options for uh, direct service to the uh, Kingston Foot Ferry uh, route from Port Townsend. So. Um, just, you know, these are the kinds of things that excite me and would love to hear as other um, agencies have uh, making progress on uh, linkages in particular. Thank you. Lindsay? Yeah, with that in mind, I just dropped in the chat that uh, the link to Clallam Transit's operational um, analysis project. Uh, we've got a survey open. It should close any day now. So I don't know it's that it's fresh to distribute because it's been out for a while and I think it's closing, but I just checked the survey still open. So um, if everyone can take Clown Transit survey and help us do our comprehensive operational analysis, that would be awesome. Thank you. Uh, Gary Anderson. Yeah, to that uh, same point uh, Kate made, uh, I sit on a Gorse Coalition committee that uh, has just approved a memorandum of understanding that lays out the groundwork on how the uh, effort's gonna move forward. And this of course has to do with the solution for the, the Gorse uh, bottleneck there that is, affects us all. And uh, it's a very well-crafted document and it uh, provides uh, funding mechanisms and and uh, jurisdictional responsibilities and everybody signing on board to, uh, to a joint effort to find a solution for this. And um, so if there's any, anybody has any questions about that, feel free to get, get a hold of me. And I do believe Port of Bremerton is one of the conveners of that coalition. So thank yeah. Port of Bremerton for that. That's correct. And Axel Stracklejohn uh, heads that committee. And Michael Bateman. Uh, thanks. I was just going to report that uh, we're very excited that we have now broken ground on our uh, Johnson Parkway uh, SR305 roundabout project. And it's a big, big, big project for us. And John, thanks so much for your folks because uh, we couldn't do it without Olympic Region. Uh, it's a big collaborative project, uh, as uh, alluded to earlier in the meeting. You know, so there's a lot of projects that are too large for local jurisdictions to take on or take on on their own. And in this case, we're taking on as much as we can on our own and John's folks are providing the rest of it. And it's, uh, it's very exciting for us. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good project. Thanks, John. We're, we're very happy with it. Thank you. Beck, if I may. You're on mute, Beck. So I'm hoping you're saying go ahead. Exactly, please. I was trying to read your lips, sorry. I, I would just report, since Kate, you mentioned about a connection uh, in Kingston. Uh, we just, Kids After Answer, just literally this morning <clears throat> closed on the, on the purchase of a, uh, a passenger ferry to add to our fleet from the Bay Area. 
Um, it's one of these deals that we couldn't pass up to be perfectly honest with you. We're getting a, a $7 million ferry boat for a million bucks. Um, so it should be coming up probably sometime within the next 60 days. We've got some work to do on it, paint it, but we're gonna be adding it to the fleet so we can increase our bench, if you will, and provide a higher level of reliability for the service. I will unmute Wendy. Hi, I just had another announcement for a project that's doing well. Um, for all those who need a staycation, uh, travel to the Ho Rainforest in Jefferson County. We have a project that's going to get started through Western Federal Lands. The bid came back for this 12 mile uh, stretch, which included fish passage and bridges. And we have um, a very good bid and a lot of work will be getting done soon. Thank you. Is there anything else for the good of the order? Oh, Tammy, please. Hi, Beck. Um, I also wanted to kind of jump on board with the transit planning as well. Um, and it's not online yet, but if you go on jeffersontransitplan.com, uh, uh, we're going to have a survey up next week for our long range plan. And we, I'd really appreciate everyone um, jumping on and taking that survey as well. And I don't want to overdo everybody on surveys, but um, <laughs> we're asking, please, it would be very helpful. We're finding the internet sure makes getting information easier. Ed, when I was muted, um, I was trying to call on you and then I saw John wanted to speak. So now I'm unmuted and I will call on Ed. Is that me, Beck? Okay. Um, this may not be directly pertinent to this group, but I've always maintained the issue of broadband is essentially a transportation issue. And so when Beck talked about the session with cities last week, it didn't directly come up, but just brewing under the surface with the legislature and the governor's office is massive broadband programs that will be underpinned by a potential $1 billion federal CARES Act, one of the biggest in the nation coming to Washington, fingers crossed. There's a lot of sorting out to do, including how would the state come up with matching dollars? So I get really concerned about the public works board and the curb board, but remaining ever hopeful. Um, obviously the COVID has totally exposed the issue of broadband and public broadband in my mind being central public service. Thank you, Ed. Beth, could I piggyback on that please? Yes. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know, I just, I was tracking down some information for Ed yesterday and I stumbled upon something from the FCC. They just announced on February 12th that there will be a like a, a multi-billion dollar broadband household relief um, support. And so I've signed up. They haven't announced it'll be $50 per household um, to help offset the cost of high-speed internet services and $75 a household for tribal communities. And so I've signed up to be notified as soon as the details of that program are out. And when they are available, I will send them all to you. This is something that would be of interest to your constituents and your communities. So you'll know what to do with it. But I just wanted to let you know that as soon as that's available, I will push that out. I also want to just uh, tag on the end of that as well. Uh, I know a, quite a few people in Port Angeles uh, and our surrounding areas have gotten hooked up on that uh, Starlink. Um, and they're, they're putting, like, you can order it now. It's pre-orderable and it's cr incredibly fast, reliable, no, sh no lines necessary, all wireless, pretty, pretty crazy. I know that was something that Mason County was interested in, I think. Um, that, yeah. that's, that's correct, Beth. Uh, we've been reaching out and talking with Commerce. We're trying to pull something off and that was because of this group and uh who was it that brought was that ed that brought that that last time who brought that to me I, I, she, yeah, that was me randy 
That was you know, I thank you because that we're trying to move forward in that for our rural area. So thank you very much for that. I think Michael had a question about um, availability of the meeting recording. Sarah. Uh, right, Sarah, I think Michael um, Bateman was asking, will you share a link when the recording is ready? Because he wanted to direct some other people to it. I will do that. Uh, we will be able to probably have it posted this afternoon. And um, and it'll, it's on, it like resides online. We'll put it on our YouTube channel. Um, just so everybody knows, PRTPO has a YouTube channel. And Ed and I are influencers, and um, and so we'll put we'll put this uh, video link up there, and then I'll will send you a note that it's out there, so you don't have to wait till the next packet. Thank you. Thank you and, and with that, is there anyone else? I don't want to keep anyone from talking who wants to provide some input. But seeing no additional input and it's noon, we will adjourn our meeting. And I thank everyone very much for your participation today. It's very helpful to have the interaction and the dialogue. We appreciate that a great deal. And I believe our next meeting will be the third Friday in April. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone.